a morning star, my soul. There is a morning star. Will soon be near and bright, though now it seems so dim and far. And when time stars have come and gone, and every mist of earth has flown, a better star shall rise on this world's clouded skies to shine. The Lord be with you, beloved Pillar community. My name is Jonathan Gabhart. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar, and it's a gift to worship together in this way today. Today is the first Sunday of Eastertide, the season where we continue to sing our alleluias and celebrate that Jesus is not dead, but alive, that he is risen and reigns victorious over all creation. St. Augustine once said, we are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. So we're going to continue to sing Alleluia today. And some friends of ours at Pillar want to kick us off in that way by proclaiming their Alleluias together. Listen to this. Alleluia! 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 Alleluia indeed. Today we gather to sing and pray, to hear the words of Jesus speaking grace and truth over our lives, to come around his table, to feast in the bread and the cup, and all the while proclaiming, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship together. Hark the song of jubilee, loud as mighty thunders roar. Oh, the fullness of the sea, when it breaks upon the shore. Hallelujah for the Lord. God omnipotent shall reign. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this is our hope together in Christ. So let's worship the risen Christ and sing together.
Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, who has given us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. For centuries, the Christian church has deemed it right to not limit our resurrection celebrations to just one day. It's too important. It's too joyous for only one day. So we want to continue singing and praying our alleluias this Easter tide. So let's pray. And as we do, we'll borrow words from the great preacher John Chrysostom and we'll offer prayers for the world that Christ rose from the dead to save. Let's begin by singing. Let no one grieve at his poverty, for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one mourn that he has fallen again and again, for forgiveness has risen from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the death of our Savior has set us free. He has destroyed it by enduring it. He destroyed hell when he descended into it. He put it into an uproar, even as it tasted of his flesh. We worship you, Jesus, our Savior. You conquered death by your cross. You are the stone rejected by the builders, but have become the cornerstone. Make all of us living stones in your church. We pray that we may live in the joy of the resurrection and be a visible sign of your presence through the love that you have shown us. Hell took a body and discovered God. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took what it saw and was overcome by what it did not see. O death, where is thy sting? O hell, where is thy victory? Christ is risen and you, O death, are annihilated. Christ is risen and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life is liberated. Jesus, your resurrection brings life and light and hope to the world. So in the situations where pain and hurt take their toll, bring life. In the places in our lives where darkness looms, bring light. In the moments when the troubles of the world seem too much to bear, bring hope. For all who are suffering from illness, grief, old age, loneliness, may your resurrection be a source of comfort. Christ is risen, and the tomb is emptied of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.
hear these words of good news from 1 Peter. Through Jesus, we have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope may be set on God. Friends, because of the resurrection, our faith and hope can be confidently set on God. And so we proclaim again, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The act of God raising Jesus from the dead reorients the entire trajectory of our lives and all of history and speaks over all of creation, peace, hope, freedom. And we want to speak that same peace and hope and freedom with all of our lives. So I hope we can all be attentive to the ways that we might go about that this week. But just for now, a couple things as it pertains to the life of Pillar toward those same ends. If you're interested in becoming a member of Pillar or finding out more about our story and mission and vision together, we invite you to join us here at Pillar after the 11 o'clock service on April 25th for a light lunch and conversation. Uh, there will also be a Zoom option available if you're unable to attend in person for either in person or Zoom if you would RSVP uh, to the Pillar office by calling or emailing, that would be great. On Tuesday, March 4th, we're going to have our second men's gathering of the spring. This one will be a breakfast gathering from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. here at Pillar. So come join us for conversation, some coffee and breakfast sandwiches, and our friend Kyle Small will be leading us in a conversation of Christian witness in the workplace. So we hope you can join us again if you'll RSVP to the office. These things and so much more are just a part of our speaking peace and hope and freedom to the whole world in the name of Jesus. So as we sing this next song and as we prepare to hear the words of Jesus in scripture today, uh, let's ponder the ways that we might speak peace and hope and freedom with all of our lives. Let's sing together, I know that my Redeemer lives. Found. 
today, just one week after we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we gather around his words in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. We'll play a video made around a year ago of the pillar community offering to itself these words of Jesus. Jesus says a lot in this sermon, different topics, poignant words, and in my experience, it can feel something like trying to drink out of a fire hose. So as you listen, I want you to pay attention to your response. What words are you drawn towards? Where are you convicted? What are you resistant to? Where do you hear the words of the comforter? Don't try to comprehend every implication. Just listen for something for you. And as you pay attention, remember who it is who says these words to us and what was done for you. Jesus Christ, God for you. So hear these words from the risen Lord. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they should inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. <laughs> Blessed is the merciful, and they will be, and they will pertain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be taught sons of death. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all manner of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Town built on a hill not, cannot be hidden. Neither does a person light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Let your light so shine before men so that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry at his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, You, moron, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother and sister, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may turn you over to the judge, and the judge may turn you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out of prison until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, 
that anyone who looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. You have also heard it said, whoever divorces a woman, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for on the grounds of unchastity, has caused her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths that you made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. So let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For anything more than this is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be my name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it is not obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what you have done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves 
treasures on earth, where moths and ruffs destroy, and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, the whole body is full of light. If the eye is unhealthy, the body is full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither labor nor spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor is dressed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So why do you worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, but your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all the other things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Live one day at a time. Do not judge, or you will be judged. For in the way you judge others is the same way that you will be judged, and the measure you used will be the measure used against you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and all the while you are paying no attention to the plank that's in your own eye, and how can you say, let me remove that speck from your eye while you have the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, would give a snake? If we then, who are evil, know how to give good things, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things to those who ask Him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them, for this is the law and the prophets. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Add up God's law and the prophets, and this is what you get. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their works you recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is thrown out, cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against my house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So what did you hear? What convicted, puzzled, or comforted you? Here's what it was for me. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, you shall love your enemy and pray for those who persecuted you, so that you'll be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun shine on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Jesus suggests to us that we have heard this, that we have heard it said, hate your enemies. He doesn't specify where, but he knows that we've heard it. So where have you heard that said? You won't find it in the Bible, but we listen to a lot of things from a lot of different places. It's almost like Jesus may well have delivered this sermon to us today. So first things first, let's confess that we have heard it said, and that we are not immune to hating our enemies. To define yourself by who you aren't, saying, I'm not them, I don't roll with them, I don't do that, we don't say that, I don't think like that, I don't vote like that, I don't look like that. Be honest, you've heard it said and you've seen it done. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And isn't it tempting? You might remember John preached a sermon on this just a couple months ago. It was a great sermon. It was direct, honest, and yet, don't tell him, but I found myself distracted. As John asked us to be honest about the people in our life who we direct our hate towards, I struggled to do so. I couldn't really think of anybody in the moment. After all, I'm a Christian. I'm nice. I'm relational, I'm empathetic, I'm loving. There's no room for hate, right? And it's not that there aren't people that don't rub me the wrong way, who I stay away from, who I think mean thoughts about, but that's got to be different, right? I mean, most of the time, I don't even have a good reason for my dislike towards them. Surely they aren't my enemies. So with that in mind, maybe this call to love our enemies doesn't pertain to us because we've already figured it out. It doesn't seem to be our problem. To this notion, Jesus nuances his statement with particularly convicting words. If you love those who love you, if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what reward do you have? What more are you doing than others? You can put people in whatever categories you want friend, enemy, or otherwise, you can say you have no enemies, but the movement of Christian mission, in other words, what we do, is not simply to not hate somebody, but to love everybody. 
following Jesus means opening ourselves, stepping outside our narrow definition of community to the gospel imperative of loving our neighbors. We have to be honest about our human tendency to limit, to exclude, to build around us something safe and comforting. So do you only love your friends? This is why John reminds us at Pillar that while newcomers at Pillar note that everyone here seems genuinely nice, they often have a hard time getting plugged in, actually getting to know anybody past a smile and a brief greeting. Do you greet only your brothers and sisters? <laughs> to a culture that is obsessed with the nuclear family, family first, family over everything. Jesus says if you greet only your brother or sister, father, mother, son, or daughter, what more are you doing than others? The rest of the world does the same thing. Christians are called to be different. So who don't you greet? Who don't you love? And at the same time, I won't pretend that we're all friends with everyone we meet or that the only reason I don't love everybody is because I haven't met them yet. The word enemy points to something real. Someone said it this way, to grow up is to be hurt. You will be wronged. People will cause you harm. I know I don't have to tell you that. I know that the people I'm addressing right now, all of us here, carry unspeakable pain, trauma, abuse, tied to the actions of somebody else. And as a result, anger, fear, hate, enemies. And Jesus makes the audacious command, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you so that you will be children of your Father in heaven. I want you to notice Jesus makes a connection between love and prayer. Love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. I wonder if in our efforts to love our enemies, we need to think critically about how we pray. I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a claim. I don't know if you can love your enemies without prayer. So where do we go if we want to learn to pray? I think I heard someone say it, and there are a lot of good answers, but I don't know a better place for a Christian to learn to pray other than the book of Psalms. So what do the prayers of the psalmist say about enemies? How about this? Add to their guilt, O Lord. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Or this one, oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. These psalms that address enemies are called imprecatory psalms. So what's going on here? Does it sound like love? Do these words accidentally slip into our holy scriptures or are we to critique the psalmist? Is this great resource for prayer inconsistent with Jesus' words to love our enemies? Here's a helpful quote to help us think about those questions. It comes from a book by Miroslav Volf, Protestant theologian, the book's called Exclusion and Embrace. Here's the quote. For the followers of the crucified Messiah, the main message of the imprecatory Psalms is this. Rage belongs before God. By placing unintended rage before God, we, both, we place both our unjust enemy and our own vengeful self face to face with a God who loves and does justice. When one knows that the torturer will not eternally triumph over the victim, one is free to rediscover that person's humanity and imitate God's love for them. Love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, not to gloss it over or to disregard the wrong you've been subjected to, but because only by bringing to God your actual thoughts and feelings, by coming to the light of the world, can you love somebody else. To be a Christian is to do something different, something new, to love 
To be clear, we aren't able to do this simply because Christians had a new idea or an accountability community. We can only do this because someone went before us to make a way where there was none. Jesus, who loved us when we did not love him, who greeted us as brothers and sisters even when we rejected him. To go the way of the crucified and risen Lord is to love our enemies, to open ourselves to those around us, to be made new, and in that way to do a new thing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Here at the table, we're greeted once again as brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ meets us here at this table by his Spirit, and the bread broken and the cup poured out. He says, this is my body given for you. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you believe Jesus is Lord and acknowledge him as Savior, you are welcome at this table. And if you're not at that place for whatever reason, I just want to invite you to think about the words that you've heard. The ensemble will lead us. Song of Jubilee, loud as my thunders roar, or the fullness of the sea when it breaks upon the shore. Hallelujah, hark the sound From the center to the skies Wakes above, beneath, around All creation's harmonies See the victor's banner firm Chief this sword, he speaks, tis done Shall reign from pole to pole with the limitable sway. He will reign when like a scroll, highest heavens have passed away. Then the end beneath his rock, our last enemy shall fall. all in all Then the end beneath his rock Our last enemy shall fall Hallelujah Christ in God God in Christ is all in all Hallelujah
Friends, let's continue by singing together our sending song, Alleluia, Jesus is Risen. about to enter into every sector of public life to proclaim the good news of the risen Jesus. So now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. is all in. 